James Tompkins. I don't know why I'm doing this because James has spoken to this group at least twice before, I think. Twice before. Uh, James, an all-time great rower. Three-time Olympic gold, one bronze. Commonwealth Games bronze, the uh, Commonwealth Games gold, seven times world champion, 15 times winner of the King's Cup. A pretty impressive effort. James serves on the Australian Olympic Committee as a member of the International Olympic Committee Athlete Commission. He works in, the, in financial resources services for uh, UBS. He has the Order of Australia, and he has the, the Thomas Keller Medal, which I understand is the most prestigious award of the international rowing community. Gentlemen, I give you James Tompkins. Thank you, Chris, and uh, good to see some uh, familiar faces again. Um, I don't know. The fact that I'm back here for the third time means you're giving me a third chance or, uh, or uh, it was half decent. But there's always, uh, there's always a lot to, to um, talk about uh, with the Olympics and in particular the last few years it's, uh, has been extraordinary. But Chris, you mentioned I was, on the, I was on the AOC executive and on the IOC which finished up in Tokyo. So I was elected onto the Athletes Commission in 2012. And so you're a full voting member of the IOC, you know, you're choosing host cities and, uh, and uh, what sports are in the games and all that sort of stuff. But it was, uh, so I was elected by all of the athletes at the games in London. So there was uh, four positions and 23 candidates. So that was, that was pretty cool to have all my peers from not just Australia, but from other countries um, vote myself and, uh, and three others onto the commission. But that finished up in Tokyo, so uh, I'm no longer on the AOC executive and I'm no longer on the IOC, so I can talk more freely about, uh, <laughs> about all sorts of things. But I've got a bit of show and tell as well, so, um, which I'll, I'll hand out. Do I hand? Sure. Yeah, yeah, okay. do so, um, the Tokyo, well actually let me talk about the Tokyo Games first, in that, um, yeah, what a fantastic games, unbelievable games. And there were so many, or not so many, there were quite a few people before the Tokyo Games saying, you know, surely you can't be going ahead with the Olympics in this environment. You know, there's more, far more important things. And then about halfway through the games, all of those people that had questioned it said, I retract that, this is the best thing that's happened, uh, you know, during all of our lockdown in Australia and around the world, in fact, and the, you know, everyone was glued to their televisions and, and uh, you know, certainly in Australia we were, watching the games and seeing incredible success and seeing our athletes, I don't know whether, it's, whether it was because of COVID and the situation that they were in, having you know, had four years lead up to a Games and then had to stop and is it going to go ahead or not and keep going through. They were just so, so humble, firstly, but also so appreciative that the Games actually went ahead and that they actually got their opportunity to compete um, because it was touch and go for, uh, for, for quite a period. And you would have seen all of the interviews with our, you know, our successful athletes or those that hadn't been successful, but I don't know, just the... You know, like talking about role models, they were just, I, I thought they were fantastic in how humble and modest they were and how respectful they were of their, uh, their fellow competitors. I thought it was, it was fantastic. The swimmers, the rowers. Actually, we only, we only generally won medals involved with water. Swimming, rowing, kayaking. Um, what else were we winning? Sailing. Sailing, exactly. Sailing. So water sports, we're pretty good at. Anyway, the... Uh, the rescheduling of the games, clearly it was an issue for the athletes. And uh, I remember, you know, when, when it looked like, or when the pandemic hit back in 2020? Yeah, 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 March, sort of February, March 2020. And um, 
and I was getting, you know, a whole lot of rowers actually were calling up saying, what is happening? Is it going to go ahead? And I sort of knew that it was going to be postponed, so I said, listen, just assume that that's going to be the case. And, uh, you know, for those, for the guys and girls that had rung up and saying, you know, what's, what's going to happen, for them to put their lives on hold, and, and of course, some of them, it's going to be their first Olympic Games, and so, you know, whether they actually get to go to the games at all, some it might be their last games, and some it might be just this perfect sweet spot in their lives where they actually get that chance, and whether that was going to be taken away from them or whether they would actually be able to go through with it. So a huge amount of uncertainty for those athletes, and to have to take the foot off the gas, find out what was happening, and then recommit was extraordinary. Extraordinary, but I think Australia was very well set up as far as um, you know, we're allowing our athletes to keep training uh, within, you know, obviously with a whole lot of restrictions, but at least they could keep training. And I think that was actually why we, uh, we performed, well, one of the reasons why we performed pretty well. But it's not only the athletes that it's a massive challenge, <laughs> clearly for the host city of Tokyo, a huge, huge challenge. Um, you know, all of the venues had to be recontracted for 12 months down the track. The Olympic Village is a private uh, housing development that was pre-sold to people who were going to move in in September 2020. <laughs> now, they couldn't move in because they got, you know, so having to negotiate with a collective of all of those homeowners that were expecting to move in to keep them out until the athletes got there. Then the transport system, security, um, the volunteers, and you know, there's a whole lot of volunteers that were withdrawing their services and not wanting to commit. <coughs> so uh, a huge, huge logistical exercise to renegotiate all of these contracts with all of the venues and all the associated venues around the games and of course it was incredibly expensive and I think the I well I actually don't know the additional cost of the games but I know that the IOC contributed a further 800 million US dollars to Tokyo to help help them out um, which uh, stretched the IOC quite considerably. So the, the IOC funding model, essentially they'll generate between five and five and a half billion in revenue over a four year period through television rights, predominantly through television rights and through what well, they, they call them top sponsors. It's a, a sponsor that owns a category, healthcare, financial so you know it'll be one company that'll say that is my sector and they'll pay a lot of money for that. Anyway, five and a half, five to five and a half billion over a four year period. They keep ten percent of that for running the administration of the IOC. But the the rest of it is split a third, a third, a third. A third goes to national Olympic committees. So there's two hundred and seven of those. Half of them are broke. So the IOC essentially funds those national Olympic committees so that they can actually send athletes to the games because if you don't have the whole world competing it's not an Olympic Games. I mean that's the beauty of it. Another third goes to all of the sports to keep them running and again a lot of the sports aren't self-sufficient so uh, they need that funding and then the other third goes to host cities so the IOC had already committed you know a considerable amount of I think 1.2 billion to Tokyo to help them with the running of the games and um, you know, then a subsequent eight uh, or an additional 800. So a huge logistical issue for Tokyo <coughs> and for the IOC staff who basically run the thing and uh, you know, for them to turn that around in 12 months and renegotiate all of those things that I said and get the funding in place and get agreement from all the levels of uh, Japanese government was just extraordinary. And if any of you have dealt with the Japanese, uh, they have a hard time making a decision. 
so uh, there's always someone up above that you have to defer to and um, so uh, you know and as you can imagine in a 12 month period you have to make pretty quick decisions they've got to be right decisions but they've got to be pretty quick so that was also a challenge and then of course there was the whole COVID issue so uh, every athlete obviously had to be tested beforehand as soon as you were right, every athlete, they call it the Olympic family, so that's athletes, coaches, administrators, um, IOC people. There's about 17,000 people in this family. <coughs> and uh, so 10,000 athletes, you know, 3,000 coaches, anyway, 17,500. Um, every one of those people, when they arrived in Tokyo, were tested at the airport and had to wait at the airport until you got the results, so that's a couple of hours. Uh, it was pretty quick for us. We came in, we were the only flight to arrive, or when I arrived it was the only flight, but there was some, some athletes where there's three and four flights arriving at the same time, and it was taking like seven hours to get through the airport. But, you know, that was okay, because they understood the, the circumstances. And then every single day, each one of those 17 and a half thousand people were tested. So it was just a saliva test, a little test tube, and a straw and you would spit twice or two spits into the test tube scan it with your phone drop it off and no news was good news so uh, if you if you got a phone call it was bad news if you didn't it was good so uh, so seven and a half thousand uh, people tested every single day through the entirety of the games or the entirety of the when the whilst those people were there and yeah, I think there was 130 positive cases in the village, and oh, that, that included media as well. So you've got the media; they're all part of that as well. Anyway, very, very few case numbers, and it was an extraordinary, extraordinary games performance-wise, but an extraordinary games to organise that and to um, uh, work in that COVID environment and actually deliver a games, which was such a well, I thought it was such a fantastic distraction from what was going on around us. Uh, but I was going to do the torch relay, but that was cancelled. So uh, this turned up in the mail about a month ago, which is the torch that I was going to run with. So uh, this is, it is well, I think it's beautiful. It's, uh, you know, that's rose coloured gold. And, um, there's no gas in it. I checked if there was gas, I was going to light it. But, uh, in fact, I've got a couple of other torches at home and there is one with still the gas canister in there and still lights. You know, but I can't get a replacement. Anyway, I'll hand this around. You guys can uh, have a look at it. So, uh, Chris, you can uh, do the honours first. I think um, I'll take it home. No. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if I could get it back. Um, that'd be good. <laughs> And don't drop it either. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, you're gonna dig your bell with it. <laughs> but yeah, so you know the torch reel they've probably got you know, it's gonna go it gets lit in in um, Olympia in Greece and travels across the globe to uh, to Japan and would have gone through all of the community and and you know, uniting the community around uh, around around the games. And then, uh, actually, I'll, do you guys, uh, you, you're all aware in Tokyo of the newer sports, of, uh, you know, rock climbing, skateboarding, yeah, surfing. Yeah. So what did you think? Terrific. Good, terrific. Yeah. Yep. Any, uh, any, well, you're probably not going to say if you're the contrary, but... Uh, <laughs> well, the skateboarding was amazing. The skateboarding was incredible. <laughs> yeah. And we're seeing the same thing in, in the winter games, the, all of the, you know, you've got the traditional alpine events, but then the sort of the freestyle events of the slope the half pipe and the slope, slope style and yeah. it is just it is yeah it's revitalised the winter games and the summer games took that approach as well to say we've got the traditional sports of rowing and swimming and athletics and all of those but we need to be much more youthful and um, and and also taking into account the environment that everyone lives. We're so urbanised that we need people to be involved in sports that can be done in an urban environment. Skateboarding, rock climbing, 
three on three basketball. You know, um, where you've got a half, you know, a half court. You can do those in the city. Surfing, obviously, you've got to go elsewhere. Uh, and fortunately, with surfing, there was a hurricane off the coast, which actually, because <laughs> it was going to be, it was going to be like the bay. It was going to be dead flat. But the hurricane turned up, and so they got waves. Um, but sir, you know, those sports. So um, yeah, they were a great success. And of course, commercially, they open up a whole new market for the IOC marketing team to. Uh, the youth and of different sports and uh, you know, much more urban oriented. So again, marketer's dream, television rights, of course, more viewers, you know, all the skateboarders and surfers and rock climbers, they're all now watching. Um, and you know, again, taking the example from the Winter Games. So that was a, a huge success and those sports will continue, will continue on uh, in Paris. With the addition of breakdancing, in Paris. Hands up, who thinks breakdancing should be in the Olympics? <laughs> Not many. Well, I actually wrote the report on uh, breakdancing. <laughs> and, and, uh, but the thing is that uh, the host city gets to choose, well, they ask, can we have particular sports in the games on a, as an addition to those existing sports already? And they wanted breakdancing. Apparently, it's huge in Paris. And again, very well, very youthful, but also very urban. You know, all you need, essentially, all you need is a um, some cardboard, so they can spin rather than on concrete. Uh, some cardboard on a corner, and um, anyway, go for it. But it's uh, it's actually a uh, it's um, I went to Mumbai for the break dancing world championships. Which, uh, which was, that was really good. I missed those. And it's, uh, it's really, uh, <laughs> it's really, um, it's an interesting sport. So it's basically a dance off where, so Chris and I, ch we challenge each other for a dance. And then Chris goes first and you do your thing and I'm watching and then. It's pretty bloody horrible. So it is horrible. <laughs> and then it's my turn, I do it and, and uh, so, and then you respond to me. And so it's sort of this interaction where I have to respond to what Chris is doing and and anyway it's, it's very different but it's um you have a couple of guys each week going back and forward and they don't know what music it is so you have to adapt your style to the music you have to adapt your style to the other person and um, anyway it works it seems to work but the, the Parisians want it and so they'll get it and just on uh, the new sport surfing so surfing in Tokyo fortunately there was a hurricane or a typhoon? What do they have up there? Oh, typhoon. Typhoon. Yeah. typhoon. Um, so they had waves in Paris, or for Paris, they're going to have the surfing in Tahiti. Oh. <laughs> and these waves in Tahiti, it's like pipeline in Hawaii, but double. It is it's an unbelievable wave. It's, uh, so, um, yeah, the surfers are. Some of the surfers are really excited about it, some are a little nervous because uh, it could be huge. But anyway, and then the, you know, the changes in the games, I mean, just talking about Paris, uh, you know, the games are trying to be much more inclusive to the general populace. Instead of having the games, you know, I mean, Tokyo was different, obviously, because of COVID, but, you know, really tight and controlled. But Paris, their opening ceremony is going to be down the river through the middle of the city, not in a stadium. So the whole of Paris can come out and watch. Um, having mass participation events. You know, a couple of days after the marathon event, have a, have a, have a on the same course, have anyone that wants to join in um, go down the course. In the rock climbing, as soon as the competition's finished, let kids come on and do the course and the same with the skateboard so it's much more inclusive in trying to get people not only you know you watch an event you think that's fantastic what an incredible um, athletic achievement but for then allowing people to then go and try it themselves and uh, especially kids to get inspired by that and, and have a go so um, so that'll be that'll be pretty cool um, I will uh, You've probably seen. I've, I've handed my medals out before. There's probably got them back. 
I've got them all back. I'll, do it. I'll let you, while, I'm, while I'm talking, I'll ramble on for a bit more, but um, I want to talk about Brisbane as well, which is really exciting uh, coming up. But I've got my medals here, um, which I'll hand out again. Yeah, yeah, Do you want to have, have a look? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a look over lunch as well. That's, uh, that's the Barcelona one. And you'll notice on the, well, this is the bronze from Sydney, which broke. But um, uh, on the front, or on one side, is Nike, the Greek goddess of victory. So she's got to be on there in one form or another. And on the other side is the host nation's motif. So uh, that's, the, that's, the one from, that's the bronze from Sydney. The bronze looks like a gold in nightclubs, let me tell you. So, <laughs> can't, it works well. It does work well. The uh, one from Atlanta, the biggest and shiniest, of course, being American. Yeah. Although the medals now are huge. The last few years, they're so much bigger. And the ones in Tokyo were made from recycled phones, from all the metal components in recycled phones. And probably my favourite one is the ones from Athens, which is a very, I think it's a very elegant design, and it's pretty much... Uh, all of the, all the later medals uh, of um, of London and yeah. Tokyo were modelled. Well, there's a lot of similarities with this one, just a hell of a lot bigger. So that's um, and that's a ribbon from Sydney. Uh, now Brisbane, I'll keep going on for another five or so minutes, and then certain, you know, love to uh, field some questions. So Bri I'm so I was over in Tokyo for um, for the for the Brisbane bit. And uh, which is an interesting, it's a new process. Instead of inviting uh, candidate cities to spend, like they were spending 60, 70 million dollars on a bid. And you might have four or five cities and only one is gonna be successful. So you got you know, three or four cities who have spent this amount of money for nothing. And um, clearly that's, uh, in, today, in the times today where there's uh, you know, accountability and, and, and fiscal um, uh, can, well, you know, <laughs> making sure where you spend the money is, a, is, a, is appropriate. The IOC, well, John Coates, the president of the Australian Olympic Committee, funnily enough, came up with this idea of let's select the city that's most appropriate beforehand and then it's just a matter of voting for them knowing full well that Brisbane was uh, very well equipped. So anyway, that, I don't know whether that was the case or not. It seemed to be fairly serendipitous. Um, but instead of these cities waste, or not wasting, but spending all of this money on a bid, they would have uh, the cities that were interested and the IOC would talk to those cities and say, uh, you know, Munich, yep, we'd love to have you involved, but you need to build a hell of a lot of facilities and you've got some issues over here. So maybe, not this time around, but if you're still interested, you know, if you get those things in place, maybe next time. So they'd whittle that down to a couple of cities and then it would be a case of going to the governments of those cities and you know, asking, are they prepared to, um, there's all sorts of guarantees around security and um, uh, immigration and, and also yeah. infrastructure funding if they need stadiums and, and things like that so whittle it down to a couple of cities but Brisbane was in the box seat all the way through because they had the three levels of government all lined up federal state and local and uh, a lot of the facilities already in place or they will be temporary facilities but the biggest reason that the IOC liked the Brisbane bid is the fact that southeast Queensland by 2040, there's going to be another 1.6 million people living in that area. And uh, probably faster, and probably more now, given that half of Victoria's moved up there. <laughs> but and you've, a lot of you would know, you know, visiting up there, that the infrastructure is already at capacity. You know, they don't have a rail system for starters, but their road system is at capacity already. And they did a study of all the major arterials arterial roads and even at current levels they're at sort of 97 98 percent capacity on average so they desperately needed 
this infrastructure. And the IOC loved the fact that the Olympics will be used to, as a catalyst to fast track a lot of this infrastructure spend. So legacy is really important to, for cities, to build these facilities, to have a games, and to leave a legacy for that region for the next you know, 40, 50, 100 years. And that's the, that's the vision for the games in Brisbane. And it's not necessarily you know, huge stadiums being built. It's more around community centres, you know, like MSAC down at, uh, in Middle Park, where you need a whole bunch of those in, in these population, or in these growth areas, for you know, all of the different sports, for events. So it's not necessarily you know, stadiums or velodromes or things like that. It's all of the associating areas that you can use for gymnastics or badminton or table tennis, basketball, that will then be used down the track for kids' sport that, um, you know, or the, the, um, the one up on um, Tulip Street. Uh, Bay, Bay Street. Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. All of those uh, community sports centres, is um, so they need, you know, more of those. So it's, uh, it's got all the three levels of government support. It's based on a fundamental requirement for infrastructure, both road improvement and rail, linking Gold Coast, Brisbane, South East, uh, Sunshine Coast, and then inland to Ipswich. So ideally, it's going to be a T of, of, of fast rail. Um, and then a you know, redevelopment of the Gabba and uh, some of that area. I think the village is going to be near the airport on the river, on that floodplain, so it could be an issue. Um, and then we just saw the Super Bowl yesterday. So it goes, uh, next game's at Paris, then LA, and then Brisbane. And the stadium that was built, well the stadium that they used yesterday in the Super Bowl in Los Angeles, brand new stadium, cost five and a half billion dollars to build this thing. And basically it was built to lure the Los Angeles Rams football team back to LA. So Los Angeles Rams went from Los Angeles to St. Louis, and then the owner, you know, obviously been negotiating with LA, just packed up his team and overnight essentially moved them back to Los Angeles and with the hook of this stadium being built for them. And obviously it's gonna be used for a whole lot of other things, but, but the sta I think the stadium in Western Australia, that was like 1.5 billion, I think. So I don't know what another Four billion gets you, but it must be pretty special. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> the uh, one I think one of the reasons why it was so expensive is that it's in the flight path for LAX. So instead of being as high as the MCG, it is one story high. So they dug down, and the thing is sunk into the desert, and um, yeah, that's expensive. But it's it's a it's got a roof over the stadium. That is a giant television screen, so when you're flying over, it's actually projected up. Uh, there's all, all sorts of screens, or you saw it yesterday, anyway. It's, um, it's, uh, anyway, that is, that's gonna be used for LA. And the University of California, that's gonna be the village. I mean, they could run the games pretty much tomorrow. They've got the Coliseum already, uh, they've got this new stadium, they've got everything pretty much, so that'll be a, a pretty cool games, and then Brisbane to follow, so. Uh, and, uh, um, and this, again, using a region as opposed to a city. I mean, it's Sunshine Coast, Gold Coast, and Brisbane. It's almost all one now, but um, yeah, it's spread. Obviously, it's spread across that, that strip. Uh, anyway, that's it as far as, uh, as I've got. As far as I can talk about other stuff. Um, but I'll take questions if you'd uh, like to fire away. Thank you, James. Grant Saban. You're talking about all these new sports in the Olympics. What about hammer throwing? Do you think that's going to continue? <laughs> uh, well, I'm not... Uh, well, as far as I know, yes. Uh, it's a wonderful sport. Uh, very applicable to life. Um, no, I think some of the sports, they do look at some of the sports, and in, in all seriousness, uh, you know, some of the sports are really expensive. Rowing is an expensive sport. I mean, the equipment is expensive and you need to, you know, if you don't have a natural waterway, you sort of have to build a rowing course. 
In fact, LA is looking at, and Roger, I think Roger Wilson's here somewhere. Where's Roger? There he is. Yeah, you'll hear him before you see him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You know, Roger, in LA, they could have the course could be four hours outside of Los Angeles or have it in San Diego Harbor and make it a 1500 meter race. Rowing's always been 2000 meters. So this, you know, should sports be flexible to reduce the cost of travel in this instance or building a new course? It, um, it's more logical, James, because in 1984, as you know, Lake Casitas was a long way out of town. Absolutely. To be right where the population is would be fantastic. Exactly. Push it hard. Exactly, exactly. You take the sport to the people rather than demanding people go to the sport. Make it easy for them. James, James, with each Olympics there are guest sports with the said that great dancing is one. They also review as to whether sports will continue. How do you make up the decision? Some of the sports like you know wrestling and been around, boxing been around for a long time. How do they review what stays and what doesn't stay? Yeah, well, that's, I was yeah, talking about that with the equestrian is an example of the, there's a whole, cri a whole lot of criteria. It's, the, it's how many people do the sport, it's how many countries you know, offer that sport or, or a half decent at it, um, how many people watch it on television, how many people attend World Championships, um, and I think I mentioned the cost as well of actually putting on an event. And that's where you know some of the sports are going to be challenged because of these new sports are really easy to run. Like skateboarding, you, can, well, you, you, know, you have to build a facility but it's a pretty cheap facility and very easy to um, you know, set up anywhere pretty much. Whereas and I use the example of a question because it, they have a challenge because they lead, need uh, large areas of land. The, the horses, you know, they've, they've got addition, not just the riders, but a whole support crew around the horses, which is expensive. As I said, you've got to quarantine the horses. So horses coming in from overseas are six weeks in a quarantine facility before they... Um, the transport of, of all of the horses and the equipment. Like, so that is a challenge because not many people do it, not many people watch it, it's bloody expensive, and yeah, you get my drift. So it's expensive. Tokyo was expensive because it was in the harbour and there's flow, it's tidal, so there's flow, so they have to build basically sea walls either side, which if you build anything in Tokyo, it's really expensive because of the earthquake. Yes, <coughs> Rod Hammond. Uh, James, in your time on the International Committee, were you ever offered a bribe? No. No. I, uh, unfortunately, I joined when, uh, <laughs> when, when all these, you know, these novel notions of good governance and transparency uh, were introduced. So, uh, and I didn't see anything like that. Yeah, no. <laughs> But it was a, it was um, it was an incredible environment because there were so many there was always issues, but we had the the whole Russian doping scandal of not only athletes doping but the actual testing agency doctoring the results as well. So you got both ways. Uh, and then um, they were given so many chances to say, "Yep, yeah, we stuffed up. How bad." Up, but they just even when they were given chances to do that, they didn't take those chances. Um, obviously, the whole re you know, the rescheduling of the games, uh, the challenge of esports, you know, <laughs> how that's going to play out, um, and uh, and the other one, which uh, is really well, there's no answer. Is this notion of, of transgender? Sports and you know, on one hand, the Olympic Charter says no discrimination should be sport for all. Can't discriminate on any on any basis. But then, and it's, yeah, it's more pertinent for the females who are competing potentially against 
people who have had a lot of testosterone through their systems for all of their lives and their bone density and muscle mass is a lot different to a, a, a traditional female. So, uh, you know, on the one hand, you've got to be fair in competition, level playing field in competition. But on the other hand, you've got the charter saying you can't discriminate against anyone. And everyone has the right to play and participate in sport. So it's a real... It's a real You've got the Paralympic Games, you'll have the Transcendent Games. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. well, that, that may be. You know, who knows? And you've got in the Para Games, you've got all the different the S1, S5, S7, all the different. I mean, I don't yeah. You came to your own country to race in the Olympic Games, and the bronze medal has gone around. Tell us a little bit about how the agony was with you and your partner. Yeah, well, let's, uh... So we rode in the four, 92, 96, and won both of those both of those times. And we tried to keep the four together going to Sydney, which would have been... And we knew that Steve Redgrove, legendary uh, British rower, he was going for his fifth Olympic gold medal. And we were looking forward to spoiling his party. <laughs> and on home soil, racing against him in the fall. In the fall, unfortunately, we couldn't keep for a whole bunch of reasons. Nick Green retired, and we couldn't find an appropriate replacement. So Drew Ginn and I ended up rowing a pair together, and it was it was almost perfect, wasn't it? It was beautiful, it was perfect. beautiful, beautiful rowing. It was just uh, matched up perfectly with Drew and. Anyway, we went to the World Championships in 1999 in St. Catharines, so the year out from Sydney. And we were flying. We were a little bit. Three or four lengths up halfway. Like, margins are generally half a length, a quarter of a length, and we were, we were just doing it easy, walking away. Anyway, we ended up winning by miles, six or seven seconds. So things were looking fantastic for Sydney. Unfortunately, Drew developed a little bit of a back issue and uh, it got progressively worse, so much so that we couldn't actually compete in the selection trials in Australia. So the selectors in their wisdom said, we are the current world champions, we'll send you to Europe and we'll send the team that won all the selection trials to Europe and at a race six weeks before the Olympics, a race in Switzerland. Um, you'll both race there, and whoever finishes ahead goes to the games. So that's that's uh, that certainly focuses the mind somewhat. Anyway, Drew's back was uh, we had one regatta which we won, but Drew's back was getting uh, um, more and more tender. Anyway, we got to this regatta. So this is the, the regatta that's going to determine who actually goes to Sydney Games. Our home Olympic Games, highlight of your, one of the highlights of your life. Anyway, we did. We went onto the water for our warm-up for the heat. So we got heat, semi-final, final, and it was all pretty compressed. It's over. It's not like an Olympics, which is over a week. This is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Anyway, we got on the water, and we did our first warm-up piece, and. The first hard stroke or full pressure stroke Drew took, he ruptured two discs in his back. Not just bulged them, but actually ruptured them. And he is in agony. And um, yeah, the medical boat came out to, to get him. And uh, yeah, like I'm, well, he was a mess physically. I'm a mess emotionally because this is a you know, this is a really really important race. And our coach. Noel Donaldson knew that this might be, might have been an issue and had the reserve, Matt Long, ready in his racing gear just in case. He was, we couldn't, I don't know if that was, that was uh, happening. So uh, we normally do 30 minutes on water warm up. So this is about 10 minutes into the warm up. Drew gets, uh, we actually got dragged, the boat got dragged to the, to the, Pontoon, the, the dock, and Drew was very gently taken out of the boat and straight off to uh, the medical centre. And Matt Long jumped in the boat, the reserve. So I'm going from the top ranked 
thrower in the country to number 15. So there's a bit of, you know, I mean, as long as he's a great friend, and he's a great guy, but he's not true. Uh, the other issue was that he rode on the same side as me. So when you're in a pair, you need someone that rows on that side and someone that rows on that side. And so Longy, Longy, I'm like, this is, it's a good story, right? Because Longy, in 15 minutes, had to learn how to row on the other side, essentially. It's like, it's like writing left hand, you can do it, but it's pretty ordinary. And rowing on, yeah, rowing on that side. Anyway, uh, it's, it's actually one of the things that I'm really, really proud of of just sort of working your way through it and trying to, it actually really instilled the sense of teamwork. The ultimate sense of teamwork is, well, I think it's, yeah, the, the perfect team is one where each member does everything in their power to help their teammate go as well as they possibly can. Not to think of themselves first, but what can I do to help my partner perform at their absolute best. And if they reciprocate, that is the ultimate team. Nothing about me, no selfish selfishness, but selflessness. And so that was one of the things, Roger, I had to row in such a way that at least allowed Longy a free kick to get his blade out of the water. Anyway, unbelievable, we won the heat, we won the semi-final, and then we won the whole bloody thing. <laughs> and, uh, and got the right to go to Sydney and then um, so on about four weeks training we actually started to go pretty well and uh, so that's that bronze medal. Thank you. It's a uh, wonderful story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think we're probably uh, I was about to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I won't stop you when you keep going, you might want to row on the other side. <laughs> No, I'm just going to say, like it was, Roger, it was extraordinary. Now, I've won quite, you know, a lot of medals and all sorts of races, but that was right up there as far as just working through that environment. And, you know, we named our boat Drew Ginn. He was with us in spirit. And, you know, he was sitting at home. Well, he didn't know, like, whether to, like, he was still in pain, obviously. He had an operation. Well, no, he hadn't had an operation then. But in pain, and, you know, he didn't know whether to watch the race or whether he could actually watch the race standing up or lying down. So, you know, here we are, all right, feeling sorry. I was feeling sorry for myself at various times, but I'm actually in the boat still being able to row and Drew was, Drew wasn't. So, anyway, Drew had, his, Drew had an operation, just to finish, just to finish off with. Uh, Drew had an operation. The surgeon said, that is it for your rowing career, don't go near a boat. <laughs> But Drew knows better than anyone and, uh, and started using rowing as rehab. And so we got back on the water. Roger, you'll remember, and, and raced um, raced in Athens. And uh, that's that medal going around somewhere else. So uh, we got the right result eventually, which was, uh, which was pretty cool. Anyway, that's it. Chris, over here. Much. That's a terrific uh, uh, speech you've given us. Jeff, would you like to come and thank uh, Roger? Well done. I think I can safely assure you that uh, being the third uh, presentation here, Mr. Moore, uh, appreciate you coming. Uh, I can't hear you, Jeffrey. We appreciate uh, James's uh, attendance here again for the third time, just as much as we did the first time. We have several reasons for that. One is that you're a world-class uh, and uh, Olympic sportsman of note. Um, your dad's also in the audience, so we have to say nice things about you. <laughs> and of course, those of us from Victoria uh, very well know your uh, sister, Jenny, Colby. So uh, our life wouldn't be worth living if we said anything bad about you either. <laughs> but no, it's been uh, a revelation always when we listen to you. Um, uh, I'm very interested, and I think you've changed my mind a little on the uh, on the number of sports that uh, that are in the Olympics. I've often thought that the the original was higher, faster, stronger, which are measurable. But now we have uh, subjective judgments on a lot of uh, sports and that takes it away from the original. And I guess originally it wasn't even a, uh, 
a sport of nations, it was a sport of individuals. Uh, you just turned up and you, you went. But anyway, without further ado, thank you very much for coming yet again, and I'm sure, or I hope, it might not be the last time we see you in our ranks. <laughs> so thank you very much.